Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of our 7 Investing podcast. I'm 7 Investing founder and CEO, Simon Erickson. There's a lot of attention on the international community right now. There's a lot of concerns from investors about what's going on in Europe with uh, the advances that Russia has been having on the Ukraine, but we're actually going to turn our attention to a different continent today. We're going to talk about investing in China. There's certainly been a lot of attention paid to China as well in recent years, and we're going to get a perspective on what it would mean to invest in the country today. I'm joined by James Early. James is the CEO of Stansbury China. He certainly knows more about China than anyone else that I know. James, thanks very much for joining me here on the 7 Investing Podcast. Simon, it is my pleasure, my honor. It's good to see you again. For those in the audience who don't know, Simon and I used to work together years ago, so I'm, I'm happy to, to be on the podcast and happy to see his face again also on the Zoom. The pleasure is certainly mine, James. Thank you for the kind words. I'm looking forward to picking your brain a little bit about China here, but let's start at the 10,000 foot level. You know, there's been a lot of commentary in the media about China. I know you spent some time in the country. Your business was related to it. What is the China's, China's Communist Party want to accomplish right now? The, the one word answer, Simon, is, is stability. And, and that doesn't sound so bad on the surface. I mean, Peter Drucker, an organizational thought like scholar uh, that a lot of us studied his stuff in business school, by the way, said that every organization has survival as its primary goal. And so the CCP has survival as its primary goal. Uh, prima facie, that's not so bad. I think the, the reason the CCP gets into so much reputational trouble among, among the, I guess, the international community is the methods that it used to, to secure that stability. And we see that in you know, day-to-day -day life, like for example, uh, censorship, um, you know, uh, squelching of, of negative information, uh, or if uh, you know, a, a lender, a company does something bad to a lot of people, it may be forced to uh, perform reparations that might be in excess of the legal requirement, but they would enhance social stability. So think of it as social stability at all costs. And those costs often include, uh, you know, blocking out external media, um, you know, lots of propaganda to make people love the CCP and, and the young people, by the way. Uh, anyone born, I'd say, uh, in the, the mid 1980s and after is likely to be a very like diehard communist in a way that people, let's say our age, Simon, uh, would not be. And that's because after 1989, the Tiananmen Square massacre, the, the government said, yikes, um, this is bad. We didn't like how these students protested. We need to brainwash them a lot more. And so they, they went to school learning, hey, we're the heirs to this great kingdom for you know, thousands of years of history. And, and it's true. China is a, is a tremendous country. It's made great, great contributions to the world. The culture is thousands of years old. There are many, many wonderful aspects of China. But anyway, they said, look, you're, you're heirs to this, this, this kingdom and you know, you've been stomped on for the past hundred and so years by, by foreign powers. And now it's our time. Now it's time to rise up. And you know, the, the, the foreigners are kind of holding us down. And a lot of these kids really believe this narrative. And, and so there's this rabid patriotism, nationalism that at some point kind of almost becomes a little bit scary. And China right now is, is at its all time lowest ratings in these Pew Research polls of negative sentiment abroad about the country. And that sort of thing is, is a contributing factor. So I am swerving with the answer a little bit. The one word answer is stability. The, the, the reason that it's such a big topic is the methods that China or the Chinese government, I should say, has employed. Makes a lot of sense, James. Uh, let me double click on the patriotism aspect that you mentioned on there. You know, we know that the consumer in the United States, consumer spending, this, this consumer discretionary spending is about 70% of our overall GDP. Uh, the number in China is lower, but it's not insignificant. About 54% of China's GDP is coming from the consumer spending. To the point you made about patriotism, it's a little different over there. Uh, how, what can you tell us about the Chinese consumer? You know, do they buy in different ways than Americans do? Do they think of brands differently? How does the, the average typical consumer in China differ from the, the typical consumer here in America? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Simon. And by the way, I like your shirt. It's a lot like shinier than mine. I, I got to respect it. Um, I'm just, just admiring. Anyway, on your question, you've got better data than I do. 54% is, is, is a current number. I will tell you that probably 15 or 20 years ago, that number was like 19% or 22% or some, some small number. 
And, and that was problematic. It was too export dependent. Now they do have their own um, you know, internal consumer economy. So that's a, that's a good story economically. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the issue for the American brands like Nike, um, you know, Apple, uh, or you know, Adidas, not American brand Adidas, but a, but a foreign brand is that there has been a fairly rapid shift from, from uh, uh, foreign brands, I guess, in, in China to domestic brands for two reasons. One, the quality of the domestic brands has actually got, gone up quite a bit. China has you know, grown past being a low-end manufacturer and actually makes some decent stuff. I mean, certainly shoes, and, and you know, fitness apparel, for example, they can make stuff that's just as good as Nike can make. And this rabid patriotism is causing them to, to sort of go inward when they purchase their stuff. And especially when something like the, the Xinjiang controversy emerges, right? You know, China has these people in these, these camps, Muslims, and you know, there, there are differing accounts about the exact treatment of them, but, but the overall idea is it's not good. And, and many in the US and Europe have declared it a genocide. And Xinjiang support, supplies like 80% of China's cotton. And, and so there's this issue of, you know, do the American brands want to use cotton from Xinjiang or, or sell into this market? And uh, some of them are, are stepping back from this. Some of them may be required to step back from this based on, on legislation here in the U.S. And the Chinese retailers, the Chinese brands are picking up that slack. And they, they advertise this stuff is proudly made with Xinjiang cotton. And, and those rabid you know, patriot consumers eat that up. So yes, basically, uh, even as, as short as five or 10 years ago, there was a strong preference for foreign brands. Uh, now it's skewing quickly towards domestic. The one exception is the luxury brand, Simon, because you know, there is no Louis Vuitton of China. You know, there is no Hermé or you know, all those high-end brands, except for high-end alcohol. Uh, Multi has been a very good stock there. The uh, and this this is Baijiu white liquor is uh, I don't I don't drink. I tried it once. I mean it was like you know fire water like jet fuel. I could, I couldn't even drink half a drop basically. But uh, in, anyway, they don't have the high end brands. They know that um, you know China is just not a high end country yet. But for they do have they used to have just the low end stuff, and I say now they got the middle end stuff. So that's a negative story if you're a Nike. That's a negative story if you're an Apple. And, and the Chinese consumer wants to buy a Huawei phone. James, thank you for the kind words about my shirt. I will gladly send you one of these seven investing shirts <laughs> over. If you'll send me some of that Baijiu Firewater, that sounds fantastic as well. You get a deal, Simon. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's talk about the tech sector. This is one that's kind of sensitive, James. We're going to go there anyway. Uh, because China, you know, there's there's so much enthusiasm about a billion and a half people, you know, all of the advances that it's making in technology, a lot of Companies are being compared to China, right? The Netflix of China, the Amazon of China, whatever you want to be of China. Uh, we have also seen that China has, during the past decade, filed more than 390,000 AI patents, artificial intelligence patents. That's 75% of the world's total, but still a sensitive topic, James, because we know there are concerns about IP protections, about privacy, about theft of IP over in China. Uh, how do you think about innovation and just IP in general in China? Oh, it's, a, it's a broad question. It's a great question. You know, by, by the way, I read something, this is maybe two years ago, but the Chinese government has been outspending the U.S. government 200 to 1 in AI. Now, the U.S. still has a lot, probably more private sector AI investment. So it's not as bad as it sounds, but it, it's still kind of bad. You know, I, I think the U.S., I'm going to uh, take a brief tangent and say one thing quickly. I think the U.S. government, the U.S., Populists, especially the U.S. lawmakers, have a view of China that's 10 to 15 years out of date. China is more advanced, it's more aggressive, and it's been playing a long game for longer than we realize. And we're kind of caught with our pants down. And we will have no choice as a country but to ramp up government support in certain sectors like AI, like uh, semiconductors, um, maybe some, some national defense type of stocks, because the Chinese government has done the same thing. Okay, Chinese government has freely blurred the lines between public and private. And that's something that was kind of like a taboo in, in Western countries. I remember years ago, Airbus, um, there's a big stink between Boeing and Airbus. Airbus is sort of this European you know, consortium supported airline maker. And the government was sort of unfairly supporting that company compared, you know, in the eyes of Boeing compared to what Boeing got from the US. With China, that's like pocket change. They freely, massively support 
all their, their industries they want to. And their logic is, so what? That's our model. It's not a problem. It's not unfair competition. It's what we do. So they have no problem to support research uh, in AI and uh, you know, advanced materials and all sorts of things. And they see AI, by the way, as a tool of government control, going back to that stability. China, China has more cameras per capita than any other country in the world. And that's impressive when you have 1.4 or 1.5 billion people. Um, but the, the support has not just been simple monetary research support. Uh, the, you know, if you go to China, you, you may read on this US State Department website, be careful about how you use the internet. As foreigners, you're only be allowed to stay in certain hotels because the government will monitor your internet. And there have been instances, for example, of the Chinese army hacking travelers' data and finding out information, let's say about a merger or some deal that's about to happen and supplying that information to a competing bidder who's Chinese. Uh, that's, that's one example, just stealing technology is another example. I think the US Office of the Trade Representative, it's a you know, government agency here, has estimated that writ large Chinese theft of American IP is something like 400 to $500 billion per year. That's a big number. And to give it some scale, the, the plain old purchases of Chinese, you know, by China of US goods and services is a little over a hundred billion dollars per year, the legitimate purpose purchases. So that's Simon, that's like someone who goes into a store and buys one shirt, perhaps not the shiny shirt you're wearing, but buys one shirt and steals four or five more. Okay, I, I don't mean to be harshly direct, but you know, these are the numbers. And maybe that estimate, it's just an estimate, maybe it's not totally accurate, but it is probably very directionally accurate. So there is still lots and lots of theft going on in the system and it has massively enriched the Chinese economy. And not just of the US, of you know, Japan, apparently the high-speed rail was at least partially stolen from the Japanese. Uh, I've seen uh, literally in meetings, people grab uh, PowerPoints or presentations with stuff they weren't supposed to and, and just walk out the door with it. Uh, it is you know, the, the, the culture, the current culture or situation there is kind of leans towards a success at all costs climate. And I want to be careful not to stereotype because certainly not everybody there is like this. And, and absolutely, certainly people in the U.S. of, of Chinese uh, descent are not necessarily like this. So I, I want to draw the line, what I'm saying here, but there is definitely this presence in China of just do whatever you can to get ahead. And that's why the country is the largest violator of IP uh, you know, copyright and trademark laws. It's just, it, it, it's, it's not an issue. I mean, as, as, a, as someone who had a research business there for, for a while and we would publish uh, content sometimes from writers and we had to, to fire a bunch of them, Simon, because plagiarism would just rampant. They would just copy, copy. And our stuff got plagiarized too. People would steal our stuff. It's, I mean, that does happen in the US, but it's like 20 or 30 X more in China, which is way more common. I dealt with more plagiarism in a month in China than I dealt with in, in probably 15 years of working in this industry in the U.S. So, so the IP theft is a problem, although they are uh, developing their own stuff to some degree now. There are some Chinese drugs, for example, that, that are hitting the market in the U.S., developed in China for the first time. So that's a positive. Um, I was at a conference last year and I heard a guy talking about uh, a patent, a medical patent that he filed. And, and he somehow, someone in China said, oh, there's a similar patent here. And it was actually his exact patent. Someone had just stolen his medical patent and, and filed for it in China too. So, um, you know, there's still a lot of that going on as well. It's kind of a mixed bag still. Uh, and the question is, what happens when we deglobalize, when we decouple, which has been happening for the past several years? I know a China IP lawyer who said his um, caseload for copyright theft and IP theft has gone way up. Uh, the more pressure to deglobalize we're having. In other words, China knows it's going to be cut off. So this attempt to copy uh, and, and steal foreign technology has been accelerating. That's a very objective viewpoint, James. Yeah, great to see it. You know, and you've seen this from boots on the street. And you, I know you spent some time over in China. I want to chat a little bit about the investors in China that, that you've seen over there as well. You know, in the United States, we've, we've lived the American dream, right? Silicon Valley has created fortunes for a lot of individual investors. You invest in technology companies that get bigger and stronger over time. Uh, we know that a lot of European investors love dividends. They love larger companies that are paying out a portion of profits as dividends. 
Uh, how do individual investors think about the stock market or about enterprises in China? Oh, fantastic question. Um, if, if we look back in the U.S. now, the past couple of years, especially, you know, a year or so ago during this meme stock frenzy, we got a glimpse into what day-to-day -day investing in China is like. Okay, it's, it's primarily done by people who are you know, the primary investor in the U.S., at least, you know, if you're a brokerage looking to target demographic, it's probably this um, uh, male who's 60 years old, you know, nearing retirement, preparing for retirement, you know, has amassed a bunch of assets. In China, those people are, are kind of too old to be into the stock market. It's a younger person, maybe someone in his or her early 30s, probably trading on, on an iPhone or a Huawei phone um, and, and not doing a lot of fundamental research. It's, it's not just because they're unsophisticated. I mean, partly, yeah, I mean, investing is new to China, but they, they are embracing it very quickly. But partly because, at least for most of the initial years, fundamental research didn't pay off in China. The market was too corrupt or too momentum driven. And, and it didn't make sense to dig into balance sheets, which you probably didn't trust anyway. And so there's sort of this, the, the market is like 80, it used to be 98% retail money, and maybe now it's 80 something percent retail money, but it, it's almost the inverse of the US. Uh, it's, it's a momentum driven market. It's driven by, uh, you know, sort of pure movements. There's this idea that if everyone jumps in on the same stock, we'll make it go up and everybody makes money. And that worked actually for a long time in China because it was like a coiled spring when Deng Xiaoping began this open door policy. And at the end of 1978, right, the, the, the country was just rebounding super quickly from years and years of economic repression, let's say. But that's kind of leveled off. And, and these people have seen the market go up and they've seen the market go down. So it's a, it is still the most frequently trading market in the whole world. Um, they are rapidly moving towards a more fundamentally driven market. And a study shown uh, done last year showed that investors in China who trade based on fundamentals outperform those who trade you know, some day trading stuff or, or technical analysis. So it is moving in the right direction. And these Chinese investors have a thirst for this knowledge. Um, I would say they're not there yet in the sense that you know, if we look big picture at a capital market, it should take money from investors and give it to good deserving companies and deprive it from bad companies. That's the way a capital market enriches a society, an economy. Uh, China is not quite there yet. Barring you know, major government you know, intervention, it will gradually get closer and closer there. Um, one thing I'll add though, from the perspective of, of a US investor though, there is often little rhyme or reason in what happens in China. Um, the, the main piece of advice I would give is don't go against the government if you're an investor and whatever the government supports, that's probably gonna go well. Uh, for years, it was these big national champions of technology like Tencent, like you know, uh, Baidu, like Alibaba. Uh, these are kind of like Yahoo's or um, Google's, and, you know, in fact, uh, Baidu basically stole the Google code and Google got kicked out of China uh, after that happened. I mean, it, stole is a rough word. Let's say it was transferred. And if you look at the Baidu website, it happens to look very similar to the Google website. I'll, I'll just say that much. Um, but, but the government liked that for a long time. And now recently under Xi Jinping and just as these companies have gotten so powerful, and the same thing's happened a little bit in the US too. The regulators are like, whoa, what's going on? Um, these companies have a lot of data. They got a lot of power and we don't have that. So we're going to clamp down. So over the past year, we've seen this crackdown on big tech uh, for the same reason the U.S. lawmakers have cracked down a little bit. But in China, it's much stronger and it's much more power focused. So those stocks, which tend to trade outside of China, have gone down. So if you're an ADR investor, American depository receipt investor in the U.S., you know, your Tencent, you know, your, your Sina, whatever, Sina's private, but your, your Alibaba, those companies have gone down. That's not necessarily the story for those, the companies that are traded inside of China. The, the A shares market, the domestic Chinese market actually had a decent year last year. So it depends on which side of the, the, the Pacific you're, you're investing in, um, your, your view of Chinese stocks, I'd say. That's, that's a perfect segue for my next question, which is if you're a successful Chinese company, tech company, whatever else it is, are you listing domestically on your own company's exchange or your own country's exchanges? 
because it used to be you you'd go to the NASDAQ if you wanted to raise money from Western investors. Is that changing and or is the Chinese country as, as a whole uh, discouraging their, their companies from listing on American exchange? Yeah, absolutely. Both Chinese regulars and U.S. regulars don't want Chinese companies to list in the U.S. anymore. Um, China is kind of embarrassed that these companies see the U.S. as a source of pride. Right? Like if you listed in the U.S., that's a bragging right. If you're a Chinese company, you've arrived, you're legitimate. And, and that gives you a lot of like, you know, face value in, in China. Uh, and, and the government doesn't like that. And the government doesn't also like that if you listen to the U.S., you have to open your books to a certain level of transparency that the government is not necessarily comfortable with. Um, that's why it, it was angry about the, the DD listing. DD is like China's Uber. Um, the U.S. government doesn't like that. Uh, you know, these companies, and let me give some history here. In, in two, early 2001 or 2000, Enron and WorldCom were some big accounting scandals. And I think probably your, your older viewers like me remember this well. After, in response to that, the U.S. started something called Sarbanes-Oxley, which said not only, if you're going to trade in the U.S., not only um, do, we, do your numbers need to be audited, but the U.S. PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, has to audit those audits, has to be able to audit those audits. So if you're in a foreign country, you have to make some arrangement for this to happen. And every country, every foreign country that has companies trading in the U.S. allows this except for China. And so for basically 20 years, the U.S. has made an exception literally for China, maybe to appease them, but also because American investors, frankly, wanted to invest in these high-performing Chinese stocks but it's been breaking the rules. And last year with, we had a, a year and a half ago, uh, luck in coffee was mm -hmm. essentially a fraud. And, and there have been a few others as well. Um, and, and 10 years ago, we had still more frauds in this reverse merger fraud uh, uh, period of time, let's say. So the US regulators have finally wisened up. So that the days of Chinese ADRs trading in the US are numbered. Whether it's two more years or three more years, we'll see what happens in Congress, but I'm gradually gonna be unwinding my, my holdings of Chinese stocks in the US. And so for that reason, if you're a Chinese company, you're probably not looking to do an IPO in the US. Uh, China is bending over backwards to make it easy for you to list in Hong Kong or in Shanghai or in one of the new exchanges. They have some new uh, sort of tech focused exchanges because believe it or not, it's traditionally been harder to do an IPO in China than in the US. You have to show a certain number of years of trailing profitability um, because there are so many scams. The government correctly made it very difficult to do an IPO in the US. So a lot of these kind of pre-profitable Chinese companies would come to the US to do their IPO instead of in China. And the government is realizing that and they're trying to make it easier. Let me throw another acronym for anyone watching this show. We talked a lot about ADRs. There's another one to be keeping a track of if you're investing in China, which is VIE, the Variable Interest Entity. James, how big of a magnitude of a risk is this that American investors in Chinese companies are not getting the same ownership like they are in an American listed company? I would look at this from a Chinese perspective. And in China, you know, not every law is enforced and not everything that's enforced is a law, uh, it's often said. The VIE has never really been that legal to begin with. Sina pioneered the VIE about 22 years ago. Uh, it's essentially where you have the real operating business in China, but official, but then that's held by a Hong Kong company, which is maybe held in turn by, let's say, a Cayman Islands company. And so when you invest in NYSE, technically you're owning a share of the Cayman Island company that's trading in the US, which then owns some of the Hong Kong company, which then has some like abstract, maybe ownership of the Chinese operating entity. And the real question is, will this hold up in court? Um, we have gotten vague uh, references from the government all along. Um, my, I actually have a VIE myself, a very small one, Hong Kong control of a, of a company in, in Chengdu. It's, it's used by big and, and small companies alike. Um, I don't know if mine would hold up in court. I mean, I, I have a contract, it's one page. And I, I think that's the, the, the real lesson here is there's probably little use in applying American legal thinking to the Chinese system because the government is gonna do what it wants anyway. Laws in China are written as gray as they can possibly be written to let the government have that power in selective interpretation and selective enforcement. If every law was super black and white, everybody, including the political leaders, would have to follow those same laws. And I don't think they necessarily want that. So 
essentially, uh, the VIE structure could have been killed at any time. The government is keeping it alive, I think, for stability. Because if it suddenly said, okay, all VIEs right now are illegal and everybody's going to lose their money, you'd have this like massive uproar and a lot of folks probably within the Chinese government too, and outside of China all over would, would lose a lot of money. And so for stability reasons, I don't think it will kill VIEs, but just know you got no legal protection. Um, but that bridge was crossed a long time ago if you're investing in China. There's another topic that's been getting a lot of attention, James, which is Taiwan. You know, China and Taiwan have got a long history, obviously. It's a geopolitical risk that's on everybody's mind. Um, we're talking about geopolitical risks in Europe right now, but there's been a longstanding risk between China and Taiwan. Of course, the majority of the world's advanced semiconductor chips are made in Taiwan right now. So there's some repercussions that would happen to the rest of the world. What, what do you think the most likely outcome within the next five years is between China and Taiwan? Do they attempt to annex Taiwan again? Is it more complicated than that? M my crystal ball, ball is cloudy on this one. I'd love to hear what your opinion is. As I would say as much as a 50% chance China attempts to annex Taiwan in the next five years. If you look at the political rhetoric, the, the, the transcripts, and I have to read the English transcripts um, fr from the leaders, it has gotten uh, slightly more belligerent about Taiwan, um, but they're, they're measured. Uh, I, I think they realize that a sudden invasion of Taiwan would not go over well in, in the, the global political climate. They could do it b before, let's say, the U.S. or any other military could come to, to respond because it's, it's really close. So it is possible, um, as you and I talked about a few weeks ago, I think, the, the semiconductor factories may get blown up in that process sort of as a, a poison pill deterrent. Uh, I don't think that would be the, I don't think that's China's main reason, though. I, it's a big political thing, like you know, reunification of, of these countries. I mean, for, for much of history, Taiwan was actually not legally a part of China, but then recently it was, you know, before, um, you know, before the CCP took power. So uh, they say, we want to go back to those days. They see it already as, as a part of China. It's just a matter of time in their minds to reunify. So that, if anything else, is one of the most core uh, nationalistic beliefs. And so I would say, it's hard to guess, um, I would say 50% chance that something happens in the next five years. Definitely something investors have to keep in the back of their minds. James, I mean, this has been an objective look at things, right? We've been critical of things, but we're seeing it like it is. There's a lot that, you know, we're excited about with China, a lot of people, a lot of progress, but also a ton of risks right now. All of this that we've said, do you believe that there are investment opportunities that you'd be comfortable, even with all the risks that we've described, in taking as an investor in China, even if it's broader trends or broader markets that you're looking at? Is there any opportunity in China you're willing to take the risk on? If, it, if I did, it would be in either private companies in China in a sector the government supports, for example, healthcare. It, it's often happy to get foreign money coming into the health, healthcare sector, which is currently like 5% of China's GDP spending compared to 18% here in the US. Um, they've got a rapidly aging population and they need support there. Elder care is another one. Um, I would not buy US traded Chinese EDR, ADRs if I were to invest in stocks in China somewhere, it would be through an ETF traded in the US that owns domestic Chinese stocks, uh, a company called Crane Shares, K, Crane with a K, K-R-A-N-E shares, um, has a number of those offerings. I don't have an economic connection to those guys. I just, just know them. Um, they, their ETFs allow you to buy direct Chinese listings. I think those will do better than, than the shares in the US, which are subject to you know, these blacklists or the you know, ADR delisting. Uh, there, there's too much political risk to buy a Chinese stock traded here. Yeah, great, James. And then just any, any final thoughts? I know that you know quite a bit about what's going on in China. There's certainly a lot of attention on it from an investing perspective. Any final thoughts for individual investors who might be interested in China right now? Uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll echo my, my response to that last question first is, you know, if you're interested and you're you know, a, a bargain hunter, and, and you feel, well, first of all, remember that the domestic Chinese stocks are not as down in the dumps as those traded in the US. So don't just look at your US stocks and think, oh, you know, Chinese stocks are, are all down. I want to bottom fish. They're not, okay? The, over the past year, the, the Shanghai Composite Index, I think is, you know, flat, maybe down a bit, um, but it's, you know, it's kind of been up and down. It's, it's not some, uh, you know, down 25% like most of those traded in the US. 
uh, I, I would I would be careful. I would understand the risk. The the bull case is that there's a government put, meaning the government just won't let these companies fail because that would affect social stability. Broadly speaking, though, I would prepare for more regulation. China is moving uh, rapidly towards a more regulated climate. And depending on your perspective, that's either good or bad, but it is frankly the reality, Simon. So whatever you do, make sure it holds up to, to that thesis, because I think that's the new reality. Well, once again, James Early, the CEO of Stansbury China, an expert on investing in China for several decades now. James, really appreciate you being on the 7 Investing Podcast. It's my pleasure, Simon. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this edition of our 7 Investing Podcast. We are here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.